We are live on YouTube. All right, shall we go ahead and get started? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon and uh, welcome. My name is Jim Liebram. I'm, the, uh, I'm with the Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District, and I'd like to thank you who are here in person and those who are on the uh, YouTube link as well. Um, you know, we obviously had some noticeable impacts from Gypsy Moth this year, and uh, hopefully after today's presentation, uh, we'll have some uh, better understanding of uh, what may happen next year. Uh, Warren County, the district, and the DEC uh, have developed this forum to provide background and information on the Gypsy Moths after receiving many questions about what was occurring. Uh, I'd like to thank Don Lehman and Tammy DiLorenzo of the County Administrator's Office for working to develop this and hosting it today. Rob Cole from the DEC's Forest Health Section will present on the history of the gypsy moth, the impacts, and the other aspects. Uh, I provided all the or I provided the questions that were submitted to the county, and most, if not all, the questions will likely be answered uh, during the course of the presentation. But uh, Rob from the DEC um, is uh, going to look has broken them out separately too, so he can follow up on some of them as he termed interesting, uh, which I think is good. So that shows a lot of people are thinking uh, out of the box here. And I know that Don has received some additional questions. And uh, for those of you who are on the live stream, please feel free to submit questions. And those of you who are here in person, please feel free to wander up to the podium and uh, so we can hear it and uh, you'll be seen. <clears throat> uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be available at the county's YouTube account. Uh, we initially had the idea of wrapping this up about two o'clock, so, but there is some flexibility if necessary. So today is an opportunity uh, for you attending via YouTube to submit questions. We'll do our best to answer them. Um, if they haven't been addressed during the presentation and after the presentation, feel free to continue sending them to Don at the county or myself at Soil and Water. Uh, just a little background, Randy Rath of the Lake George Association and I first noticed this outbreak as we were working on a stormwater improvement project at Exit 21. Uh, of the Northway in early June. And uh, the droppings from the caterpillars uh, was very evident what was going on, but the noise was very interesting. We couldn't figure it out. Um, <clears throat> and then after that, Randy was able to utilize the, uh, the Lake George Association's drone to get some pretty dynamic images west of the uh, Northway. And uh, those images actually have gone uh, statewide. So uh, that's been a, a great benefit. Uh, during the initial outbreak, the county started to receive email inquiries about what was occur occurring. And fortunately, uh, for county residents, Sarah Frankenfeld of the Warren County Planning Department developed a web app, and some of you may have used that, um, to allow landowners and others uh, to report impacts and uh, submit images of the impacts. This helped to get a better understanding of the severity of the outbreak and what was occurring. And I've asked Sarah to show the app and the uh, impact map. So, Sarah, if you could uh, do that, that'd be great. Sure, sure. I'm going to share my screen. So um, thank you to everybody who participated in this project. If you did, you probably filled out a form uh, listing where you observed caterpillars, and then you had the option of providing some uh, a text description along with that, um, as well as pictures if, if you're interested in submitting that. So uh, we got in the vicinity of about 250 observations countywide. You can see that the bulk of those were along the lake. Um, so we had very few in Johnsburg, Thurman, Stony Creek, Lake Luzerne. I think that's potentially partly a function of population, but also I think um, as we all observed, the outbreak was clustered primarily in the lake communities. We had uh, 70 observations in the town of Queensbury, um, 50 in Lake George, 34 in Hague, 31 in Bolton, and 24 in Warrensburg. Other towns were single digits aside from that. But if you haven't looked at this map um, yet, this kind of gives you an opportunity to see where we had reports of caterpillars. You can click on any one of these little um, tree icons and get more details if the person observing the caterpillars uh, submitted anything. In this case, this person submitted a, a gross photo. So um, if you want to 
entertain yourself by looking at pictures of caterpillars, this is the place to come. Um, I guess that's about it as far as what I have. I think we will likely uh, make this active again for next season. Um, and that's it. All right, thank you. Yeah, that was uh, very good. Um, I know that we sent that out to a bunch of folks who would be calling our office and through our water quality committee. And uh, I think that's uh, an awesome tool that you developed. So thank you. So, all right, so that leads us to today and why we have asked Rob Cole to provide information on the gypsum moth. And at this time, I turn it over to Rob and Rob, the show is yours. And you are muted. There you go. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen. I do have some slides to go over. Um, and hopefully during those slides, uh, many of the questions that were submitted already, uh, I will be answering and I will pull out some that maybe I don't have, that I can't answer right in the flow of things. Uh, I'll try to address those all at the end for everyone. So uh, I'm a forester with DEC, the Forest Health Unit. I work out of Albany. I'm also a certified arborist. Um, and so we've been looking at gypsy moth. I've been with uh, DEC for about 15 years now. Uh, and every once in a while, we have an outbreak in some part of the state. Um, sometimes it's places all over the state. Sometimes it's a specific area in the state. Um, but gypsy moth does pop up fairly regularly, even if it hasn't been um, a big pest in, in Region 5, DEC Region 5, you know, Lake George all the way up through Plattsburgh. Um, even if it hasn't been a big pest there in, in many years, uh, it is around the state all the time, uh, and we do deal with it quite regularly. So today, we are talking about the European gypsy moth. There is uh, an Asian gypsy moth that looks exactly like it, except it's much larger. Uh, both the caterpillar and the, the moth itself are, are quite a bit larger than our European gypsy moth that we have here. Um, I think everybody can ID it. We all saw it this, this summer. Um, it's got those characteristic uh, blue and red spots down the back. Uh, I show this picture here on the left of the screen. Uh, this is... Uh, newly hatched gypsy moth caterpillars. Uh, that's them in their egg mass there. Uh, and I show this picture just so that you see they don't always have those uh, very, dis the blue and red dots are always not very uh, obvious on them, especially when they're younger. Um, but when they're younger is the best time to treat uh, if you're gonna uh, apply a, a chemical or a, a biological treatment. Um, the best time to do it is, is when they're small and our kind of homeowner uh, ways of dealing with it on trees differs based on, on, on their size and life stage. So um, just keep this in mind as we move forward. Uh, treatment and, you know, when you see the most feeding damage and everything that, you know, that's different throughout the year. So, um, we're gonna start on this chart here uh, and we're in September. So I'll just start at September. Now there shouldn't be um, really any of the, the adult moths out there flying around. Um, they're probably done at this point. They began pupating, um, they are, they're done pupating and they should be uh, finishing up laying eggs uh, and, and going into the egg stage for the winter. So you can see they overwinter uh, as eggs in that egg mass that you find on the trees or on the side of your house, on your boat, whatever sits outside. So throughout the winter, they're in the egg mass. Uh, and then late April, early May uh, is when those eggs hatch. And that's, you know, somewhat dependent on uh, your latitude and kind of local weather conditions. Um, so I would say, you know, Lake George is probably closer to the beginning of May. They're not going to be one of the uh, earlier locations. Uh, and of course, if you're on the hillsides in the mountains there, uh, it may be a, a little bit later, but the timing of hatch is very important because that's when uh, the caterpillars are uh, most efficiently treated. Uh, so that's really what we're watching out for. And then throughout May and June, they start growing and that's when they get big and they get the blue and red dots on them. 
And by the end of June, beginning of July, that's when you see them and they're about two, two and a half inches long. Uh, and then they start pupating late June and in through July. And then you see the adults out and you see the new egg masses being laid. <clears throat> so a little difference in the egg masses and some stuff going on here. Um, some of the, a lot of the questions revolved around what should we be doing now? Is there something that, you know, some action as a homeowner or a landowner that you could be taking now? And there's a couple of things that you can be doing. Uh, one is scraping egg masses, which we can talk a little bit about. Uh, but then the other thing is if you're a large forest landowner and scraping individual egg masses is not really a, a feasible undertaking, um, then you might be thinking about aerial spraying, uh, and if you're gonna think about aerial spraying, uh, you should do an egg mass survey on your property first, to predict the number of uh, caterpillars that might come out next spring um, so, that you know, so that you know if you need to treat or not. Remember the populations crash. Um, so you can do some, some uh, survey and looking at the egg masses and uh, determine kind of how the population is doing. So, um, Picture on the right is new egg masses, and in the survey, um, you count new egg masses and you separate out old egg masses, and then there's some calculations you do um, to determine total egg masses in the tree. So you have to be able to tell the uh, new and old egg masses apart. So on the right, those are new egg masses. They're just being finished up there by the females. So you can see they're fuzzy and they have a dark tan, almost brown color to them as opposed to the picture on the left, which is an older egg mass. The fuzz is kind of smoothed over. And of course you can see uh, uh, the eggs have hatched and there are some parasitoid holes in the egg mass. So that's an old egg mass. That's not gonna produce anything uh, as opposed to the new one. So keep in mind the difference between old and new in case you're gonna do um, an egg mass survey because you will need to know that. So uh, I put this map up here, just uh, the red area is where um, gypsy moth has been for some time, they say prior to 2006. So of course here in New York, we've had gypsy moth for well over a hundred years. Uh, it was first imported uh, into Massachusetts, um, you know, 170 years or so ago. And when it got out of captivity there, started spreading, ended up in New York. So this is not a new pest here in New York. Um, this is well-established and it actually, uh, we call it naturalized at this point, meaning it does, um, while it does have outbreaks, it is, um, it is controlled by some pests that are out there on the landscape that we have here. Um, so that's why we end up with outbreak years and then many years of no outbreak because we do have a lot of things that control the population. So here in New York, um, treatment is done, you know, if you wanna save individual trees in your yard or if you have a woodlot uh, to give you some protection from defoliation in your woodlot. Uh, but at no point are we eradicating gypsy moth uh, from New York State, like I said, it's well established here and has been so for, for several years. So one of the questions that we got was, uh, why, why wasn't there any real warning that, that it was going to be so bad this year? And so we kind of go back to, to last year to see what was happening last year. Um, and you can see across the state, so the red circle uh, out in the Finger Lakes there, that's where we had it the worst. Uh, there, they had 45,000 acres of extreme defoliation there. Uh, and then to the south along the southern tier, there's the green ellipse. Um, and that was an area we surveyed because we were very concerned about that area with our aerial surveys and we didn't, there wasn't any defoliation to speak of. Uh, and to the east of that green ellipse, the yellow circle, um, we had some, uh, a few homeowner reports and a little bit of defoliation. Um, but, but nothing really major. And then you can see uh, the Oneida and Oswego County ellipse there uh, in central New York. And of course, the orange ellipse there around the Lake George area in Warren County. Uh, so last year we got, um, we got several, 
uh, calls about defoliation from homeowners, um, you know, uh, spread out throughout those areas. Uh, so we knew something was going on, but it wasn't like we got hundreds of calls and nobody was really uh, reporting any extreme defoliation. So um, what we did with that information is we went out on our social media, on our webpage, posted the information there where we were seeing defoliation. Uh, and then last fall, we actually did, uh, we did uh, have a public, um, a public meeting through our urban and community forestry program. Uh, and Gypsy Moth was one of the topics that was discussed there. Um, you know, what to expect for the next year. So, um, you know, it, it's very hard to give a lot of warning for these things. Like I said, um, it has these, these natural pests and predators and they keep it at a low population, but then there's something uh, and nobody's really sure what that something is that clicks and the populations go through the roof. So unfortunately we, we experienced that uh, this year. So you can see from the last slide where I had a lot of, you know, I had some green and yellow and those couple of orange polygons and we only had one red, one red circle to denote uh, severe to extreme defoliation. And then comes this year and all of a sudden we have severe to extreme defoliation across several counties. Um, and from the few phone calls that we got last year from around Lake George, it, that infestation uh, expanded all the way down into Saratoga County and all the way up to Clinton County in the Canadian border. So uh, the one predictor that we would have uh, to predict this kind of outbreak would be doing the egg mass survey that I introduced a couple slides ago. However, we don't go out and do those egg mass surveys and just kind of blanket the state with them. We do those in, in response uh, to where um, there has been defoliation. We often do them for our DEC foresters, uh, but currently there's, there's, just, there's not staff time um, or, or the money to go out and just do these on a, on a really large scale basis. The way the surveys work is you go into a stand and it gives you a stand level prediction of defoliation. So if you wanna predict what's going to happen on your property, you really need to do one of those surveys on your property. If, if I go and do one on a piece of state land 10 or 15 miles down the road, that data is not really good for your property because of of several things, including you know the the predator population may be different, um, you know microclimate conditions may be different. So it really is important um, that these happen locally uh, rather than on some. It's just it's not feasible on a statewide grid or something like that. It wouldn't give us uh, any real good information that that landowners could use. So uh, the landowners uh, need to do that survey on their own or or hire a professional to do the survey. And we do have the survey protocol available on our public website. So if you were to Google DEC, NYS DEC Gypsy Moth, that'll take you to our Gypsy Moth webpage. And on the right hand side, uh, on the right hand side, or if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's a link to our protocol. And there's actually a link to uh, a training that we did last fall. Um, that goes through how you conduct that, that gypsy moth survey, egg mass survey, and how to interpret the results, because it'll give you results. Um, it'll give you results based on your management goals. So um, it, it, it's very specific to your property. So if you have any questions on that, though, you can, you can get a hold of me and, and, and I can help folks walk through that. But we do have an hour long webinar specifically uh, that we did last year out in Finger Lakes to teach people how to do uh, the egg mass survey. So moving away from that now, back to what happened in 2021, um, you can see these species I have listed down the right-hand side, uh, oak, maple, apple, hickory, birch, willow, basswood, beech, aspen. Those were the major uh, hardwoods that were reported defoliated. And then white pine, spruce, and hemlock uh, were the softwoods that were reported. I would say in Warren County, the most reports I got, uh, the folks that I talked to, 
they were seeing uh, not only oak, which oak is the primary host of gypsy moth, but a lot of maple and a lot of white pine defoliation. So uh, there were some questions that got sent in regarding um, white pine and conifers in their defoliation uh, versus the defoliation of something like oak or maple. Um, so with oak, um, they generally re-leaf in the same season. So uh, hopefully a lot of you are able to look out your window or drive down the road and see where those trees were defoliated that you saw in June. And you can see now that they have uh, a full canopy of leaves on them. Like I said, most healthy trees can re-leaf right out in the same summer. Um, you'll notice the leaves maybe have like an orangish tint to them and they're a little bit smaller, but that's perfectly normal and it's a second flush. The tree you know, had to use a lot of energy, um, so they're just not producing full size leaves. Um, some folks mentioned that their tree has not leafed back out yet. Um, that's okay, it doesn't mean it's dead. You should give it through the spring. Uh, trees, that, trees that don't leaf out in the summer that they were defoliated very often will leaf out in the spring. They're just too much shock, too much stress. So they called it quits for the summer uh, and they may come back next spring. Unfortunately, if it doesn't come back next spring when, when you know, the oaks normally are breaking bud and putting leaves on, uh, at that point, it would be safe to say that the tree is done. But again, the vast majority will, will re-leaf out uh, and, and be just fine next year. Now, unfortunately, with the white pine and spruce and hemlock, those are a bit more complicated because they, uh, well, they don't drop their um, leaves on an annual basis, all of their leaves on an annual basis. Uh, they keep multiple years and only shed older needles. So um, with something like a spruce, um, there is a little bit of research on that that uh, suggests, you know, er the early, early season defoliation is really hard for spruce to overcome because they put their buds on later in the year. And if they get defoliated, they don't have enough energy to put on new buds and form new growth. So uh, white pine is kind of similar. Um, it needs three years worth of its needles to maintain its health and vigor and continue to grow. So as those needles get chewed off, if you're depending on three years worth of needles and they all get eaten off, even if it is able to put out, you know, a, a new set of needles for this year, um, that's really a really hard hit to the tree. Um, and if it's 100% defoliated, uh, unfortunately, it is highly unlikely to come back. So um, some good news with your deciduous trees, your oaks, maples, et cetera, they should come back even if they haven't yet. Uh, don't lose hope, there's still time, uh, but for your conifer trees, such as the white pine and spruce, hemlock, um, that the chances of it, of it surviving 50% uh, or more defoliation are, are, are very, very low. <clears throat> so here's, uh, here's our aerial survey data. Uh, each year, the forest health section um, we fly over as much of the state as possible and map all the damage. So we map discoloration, uh, dead trees, defoliated trees, trees with dieback. Um, this year we mapped about 680,000 acres of gypsy moth defoliation across the state. And uh, to be able to map it from the air, it generally has to be moderate to severe. So we're not talking about just lightly defoliated where trees lost some leaves or had a little bit of defoliation. This is very obvious defoliation. This is, uh, uh, you know, 80 to 100% defoliated canopy. So you can see we mapped quite a bit of it. Uh, it, it lines right up where uh, folks were calling me from. It lines right up where, um, uh, you know, you are seeing the points on the map that people put in on the county website, which is really great. I, I encourage people to use that. It, it seems like it's really helpful. I can see a lot of uses uh, for the county and the towns with that data, um, knowing where a lot of defoliation is and knowing where to watch out for hazard trees and things like that along roadways in the parks. So um, I would really encourage you to put your information into that if, if, if uh, you see defoliation next year. 
So um, this is probably you're all familiar with, with this. This is the defoliation we saw um, across the state. Uh, and some of these pictures are, are from your local area. We had a lot of people concerned about the caterpillars uh, on their house and what they were gonna do to the house. Caterpillars are, are, are not gonna eat your house. They're not feeding on anything on your house. They're looking around for the food that they want. They're looking around for a mate or they're just wandering around because that's what they do. So uh, the best thing for your house um, is to get out there and wash them off on a regular basis. Um, there are contact uh, insecticides that, that you could use or have applied to your house um, that, that are registered for gypsy moth. Uh, however, um, they don't provide any real population reduction. You could spray them off your, you could spray your house, kill what's on your house, and tomorrow you could have a bunch walking all over your house again. Um, so while it's a nuisance and I know they get in the house, um, there's really not much you can do there as a preventative. Uh, again, a lot of people and a lot of the questions that I had mentioned pressure washers. So yeah, get out there with your pressure washer, wash them off the house, wash them off the sidewalk in the driveway, your porch, whatever. I mean, their, their frass will leave a, 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 it's not really a stain, it's not permanent, but it, they'll leave dark marks. You know, you'll know where the gypsy moth has been. So that stuff generally washes off pretty easily. Uh, these might be some of the photos that were mentioned earlier from Randy. I can't remember where these came from, but these might be local photos to you guys. Um, but this is pretty standard. Again, what we we're seeing, you know, quite a bit across the state. So now for some better news, I guess, or talking about how, how, how we can deal with these and what might be out there killing them already. Um, first, we have this virus, the MPV virus. I'm not going to uh, murder the pronunciation of, of the whole word there. So uh, NPV, and you can tell that caterpillars had NPV because they die when they die on the tree or wherever they, they uh, hang in this upside down V shape. Um, so it's really convenient, it's a virus, and they die and hang in an upside down V. Um, this causes a lot of mortality in the population. This is one of the things that causes the collapse of the population. So the next few things I'm gonna talk about, they bring the population down, but they first require uh, the population to build enough to spread the virus or the fungus amongst the population to kill it all. So if it's a low level population and they're all spread out and not congregating, uh, this is not such a, such a mortality causing agent. Uh, it's when there's a high population and they all get together and can spread it with each other and then and that, that kills it and then it goes back to that low level population again. So you can see all the dead caterpillars here on the tree. Um, it really does have a significant impact. And we did see those impacts from both the virus and this fungus, the Entomophaga fungus. Uh, we did see those impacts uh, across your region. Um, we saw them uh, pretty early on uh, up in Clinton County. Uh, and one thing, uh, it, it's great, especially you know, for the fungus that we're talking about here, you can see the, the, the caterpillar gets the fungus and the fungus feeds on all the food the caterpillar eats and maybe even the caterpillar. And so it, it you know, becomes this emaciated uh, caterpillar here and they just hang off the tree like that. <coughs> Excuse me. So one thing we had this summer, which was, which was a positive uh, in, in, in some ways, was we had a very wet July. As you recall, um, I mean, many days felt, felt like, you know, in, it, it felt like it was April out. Um, and so that was really great for spore production and germination of the fungus. So we did see the fungus out there quite a bit. And... Um, Ann Hayek at Cornell University. Uh, she does a lot of work with this and she was finding it at sites across the state. And uh, she really felt like the fungus was, was coming out strong and, and gonna hit hard uh, next year's population. <clears throat> so 
So uh, one of the questions that I had was about uh, the wet weather uh, and the conditions for the fungus. And so uh, in the question it asked about spring or fall, the fungus, uh, the, the, the wet weather would be best uh, in the spring, early summer. I mean, we had it in July, which was really, uh, uh, it, it bumped up the fungus with the remaining caterpillars out there, but obviously if it was earlier in the year when the caterpillars are smaller and there's more of them uh, before they pupated or turned to adults, um, it would have a bigger effect. So wet springs are really the most important. Uh, 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 wet fall isn't, isn't gonna make much of a difference. <clears throat> uh, the last thing we have here is this uh, egg parasitoid. And these pictures are from uh, right in Queensbury, actually, off of uh, West Mountain Road. Uh, and we were able to find these on several trees. It, um, and so what these do is you can see the egg mass here. Uh, they kind of pull it apart. They get in there. <coughs> and lay their eggs in the gypsy moth eggs. And the, gyps the individual gypsy moth eggs are, um, you know, they're kind of those shiny spheres that you see there. So they lay their eggs in there. They overwinter with the gypsy moth. And when it comes in the spring, uh, the parasitoid uh, feeds on the egg. Whatever eggs it didn't get, the parasitoid has a second generation that comes later in the spring or early summer. It kind of does the process all over again. So these egg parasitoids uh, can cause up to 40% mortality within a gypsy moth population. So <clears throat> if we get these together with the fungus and the virus, uh, you can get a pretty quick collapse of the population. <clears throat> uh, like I said, up to 40% mortality. So these were very extensive in the Queensbury area. So, uh, you know, that is a really good sign. And like I said, we saw the virus and the fungus, especially up north. So uh, you do kind of have the suite of um, gypsy moth killers out there in the population now, which is, which is really good. So a little bit about uh, what the average homeowner can do. There were a lot of questions about sticky barriers, how to use the burlap, um, and how, how that impacts the caterpillars that are um, on the tree and, and how they work. So <clears throat> I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation about the caterpillar size, um, kind of making a difference or what life stages and making a difference as to what kind of treatment you did. So to the left, you can see a sticky band. And the sticky band can be, um, can really be made out of anything you can wrap around the tree uh, and then make sticky yourself. So you can buy tangle foot, you can apply that, you can buy tangle foot, um, spools of it on paper that you could wrap around a tree. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you can take duct tape and turn it inside out and wrap it around the tree inside out. You can just put, uh, you know, um, you can wrap it with anything and put Vaseline on it. The caterpillars will get stuck in the Vaseline. So this picture, you know, makes it look really super awesome. You can see all the caterpillars below and then there's none above it. I'm not gonna tell you that it works that perfectly, um, but one of the important things to do is because these caterpillars are very small, is that when you wrap it around, there's gonna, you know, the, the bark is ridged all the way around, so there'll be space under it. Um, you need to plug that gap with something. So um, when we use sticky bands, we often have also have spools of uh, like cotton backing and you can wrap that around a couple times and then you put your sticky band around the top of that so that when the caterpillar hits it, they hit the cotton or whatever you're using, they walk up that and then they walk onto the sticky band 
or else if you don't plug up those gaps, um, they'll just walk right under it and you won't get a lot of control out of it. These are gonna leave on um, until the caterpillars are big enough to pupate. Um, but over that time, it may fill up and then the caterpillars will just start walking over top the caterpillars that are already stuck to it. Uh, and then they'll get up or down the tree uh, uh, as much as they want. So this will need cleaning off and you may have to reapply the, the sticky part. As the caterpillars reach the size and time that they're gonna pupate, that's when we switch over to the, um, the burlap. And so um, some folks had questions at how the burlap works exactly. So in this picture in the upper right hand here, uh, this, this woman is, she's got the burlap around the tree and it's fully open up. Um, so maybe that's about 24 inches wide worth of burlap there. And you can see she's tying the string uh, through the center. And then what you do is you take the, the, that top section of burlap and you fold it down over the string. When the gypsy moth are pupating, they're looking for places to kind of hide. You know, uh, you, you can see on the picture on the bottom there on that boat, how they're up under the rail. Um, that's very common. You know, you see them under, you know, overhangs from your house or the overhang of a rock um, on, on the bottom of branches that are coming out of trees. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll crawl up this, uh, up the tree. They'll either get under the burlap, they'll get in between the layers of burlap. Um, it's a nice texture and, the, and a place that they, they'll, they'll hide their, their pupil chamber there. So um, again, this is just like the, the sticky band. If you, uh, if you have a lot of caterpillars, the burlap may fill up. So you'll have to take it off, brush them all off. Um, <clears throat> and if you have, pupa there, then you're probably gonna to wanna to brush them off into water so that they, you do indeed kill them. So those are kind of uh, early spring and then going into, uh, or, or late spring going into the early summer. Um, and once they've pupated, they, they lay the egg masses. So then uh, scraping egg masses is, is, is the next step you can take. Um, you can use anything, uh, you, here you see it's a, a putty knife. If you've got any sort of, you know, you can use a credit card or any kind of card like that, uh, a knife um, <clears throat> to, to scrape them off. And it's best if you scrape them off into, again, some, you know, warm, soapy water to make sure you drown them, that they die, that they're not gonna emerge. If you just scrape them out onto the ground, you you know, more will get predated on than would have if it was on the tree, um, but not a significant amount. And you'll just, they will hatch uh, from eggs laying on the ground. So um, you just kind of got to do it carefully into, you know, we often take um, a small uh, Ziploc bag with water in it. And then that way you can hold it right up, right up against the tree. Uh, and then as you scrape, you know, they'll go right in it rather than a bucket or something. You know, you're putting two round things together. The edges never meet up and you end up scraping a bunch onto the ground. So anything you have that makes it easier to get them down into that you can keep close up to the tree, you can just scrape them right off there. <clears throat> um, and what this will do, so um, the caterpillars are crawling up and down the trees all the time, looking for the warm spot, looking for the cool spot you know, starting to look for places to pupate. So um, you'll catch them going up and down the trees. Uh, <clears throat> um, what it won't do is uh, stop re reintroduction. Um, uh, the gypsy moth caterpillars do balloon. So they have the silk and I'm sure many of you saw, especially the smaller ones, you know, they'll go floating by through the air. Um, this obviously isn't going to stop those, but if they do land on the ground and then they need to crawl up a tree, if you have your sticky band on it, you'll catch them then. If they balloon right into the top of the tree, well, they've missed your sticky band, but maybe they'll come down at some point uh, and you can catch them then. Uh, a lot of people asked about using a pressure washer to wash, the wash them off the tree. Um, 
a couple things with the pressure washer. Uh, I think you can do it. Um, you just need to know the pressure of your pressure washer and at what point you're going to start damaging the bark. And make sure you don't do that. You know, you're trying to help the tree, but I'm sure I could strip the bark off a lot of trees with my pressure washer if I wasn't careful about it. So um, if, you know, some folks asked about this for egg masses that they couldn't reach because they were too high in the tree, if they could get them with their pressure washer. Again, I think, you know, at that, at that rate, yeah, as long as you're being careful not to damage the bark, that should be fine. Um, I would also think because you're hitting them with a pressure washer, you probably are killing a lot of the eggs, but just know that at some point you may just be blasting them off the tree and they go fall on the ground and you haven't actually uh, killed many of them. So um, it may work, but uh, I would just suggest you be very careful about uh, <clears throat> about pressure washing the trees. Um, probably, uh, certainly the more efficient way and uh, maybe the more effective way to deal with gypsy moth, especially on the large scale um, that we're looking at here in the, in the Lake George area, Warren County, um, is gonna be aerial application of two different kinds of, two different pesticides. Um, the first one being BT, and that's a bacterium. And then the second one being the MPV virus, uh, which they call GypCheck. Um, both of these are very specific to gypsy moth. Um, the, the BT will impact other moths. Uh, but this is very limited. If you apply BT at the right time, uh, there really aren't any other moths out that would be affected by it. So you get the timing right. It's um, <clears throat> very safe to use out in the woods. Uh, it's not, you know, it's, you know, we often think of the old days, you know, the 60s or 70s when there was far more aerial spraying. They were spraying, you know, DDT and all these other crazy things that were killing birds and killing all the other insects and <clears throat> just really bad stuff. These, uh, these two things uh, that we have here for gypsy moth are, are as specific as you're gonna get and they're as safe as you're gonna get for non-target species. Additionally, um, they can be sprayed over um, residential areas. So it's not gonna do anything to you if you get sprayed with BT. And there are towns that do spray residential areas. Um, it, it is a possibility. Um, <clears throat> that being said, uh, because of the generally cyclical nature of, of gypsy moth, you know, every 10 to 15 years, somewhere in the state, it's pop, re-popping up or popping up in a new place. Um, but the specific timing of that is, is nearly impossible to predict. So the state does not maintain uh, an aerial spray program. Um, <clears throat> so that leaves uh, local municipalities or, or counties, um, if they want to spray, they are welcome to spray. We don't have anything against it. It's just uh, the way that it works in with the rest of our activities and um, kind of our um, mission for protecting the forest of New York State. Uh, gypsy moth treatments uh, don't really prioritize high on a statewide level. Um, I mentioned that we had, you know, 680,000 acres of defoliation, uh, but we have roughly in the neighborhood of 20 million acres of forest land. So um, while it seems significant, and I'm sure for, uh, you know, the landowners that are experiencing it, um, <clears throat> it seems really terrible. Uh, but on the, on the statewide level, which um, the forest health unit that I work for is responsible for, um, these targeted treatments um, for something that kind of comes and goes uh, on, a, <clears throat> on a fairly regular basis, um, we just can't prioritize that at this point. So um, the options for getting aerial application done are, um, you know, uh, in the Finger Lakes, uh, this spring, there were about 15,000 acres treated with BT 
and that was private landowners who got together. They, uh, you know, neighbors talked to each other. They created large areas, you know, of adjacent properties that needed spraying, and they went in together uh, and hired a contractor to conduct that spraying. <clears throat> And again, that was about 15,000 acres that were sprayed out there. Um, and they use BT. And, and some of the, we had uh, several questions about um, the safety of using them, especially near water bodies. Uh, BT is, is safe. Again, it acts on gypsy moth, uh, lepidopterans, the family that they're in. It's not going to act on anything else. Um, so it has been, uh, when used uh, as prescribed by the label, it is uh, safe enough to use near uh, water bodies and has been used near water bodies. I mean, they, they sprayed along Canandaigua Lake <clears throat> out there uh, just, just this past year. Um, so again, the qu several questions about what's safe, What's the best control? What do we got to do here? Um, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna say aerial application of BT is really the way to go. Again, it's the most efficient and the most effective. <clears throat> um, and along those lines, uh, someone asked about the. Um, there is dormant oil, horticultural oil, neem oil. There's just kind of some different names that mean some very similar things. Um, and you can treat egg masses with that. You can apply it yourself to egg masses and it basically suffocates them. Um, that is an option. It's harder to reach egg masses high up in the tree doing that, but it's an option for what you can reach or if you can find an applicator who will uh, either go up in a lift or uh, spray it from the ground, spray the tops of your trees. Um, I'm not sure there's any applicators out there that do kind of that ground uh, spraying up into canopies anymore. You might have trouble finding that, but that would be one option. Um, but with that neem oil, um, one person at, uh, mentioned that it is quite expensive and could there be some sort of bulk purchase uh, to bring down the cost? Uh, I think that's a great idea if folks want to be using that product. Um, the state doesn't really have any mechanism to get involved and, and make purchases and then dole it out to landowners. Uh, so that would, should be an effort organized again at the community level. Um, you know, neighbors getting together uh, who ha are under similar conditions and, and can treat uh, using that neem oil. I think, yes, that would be, the, that would be great. Uh, get together. Uh, help each other out by splitting the cost. <clears throat> and then somebody else asked, um, they want to be able to see what they've treated. So they asked if they could put food coloring in the oil um, so that as they treated egg masses, uh, they would be colored differently and they would know. Um, I don't, you would have to find an oil-based uh, color additive to add to the neem oil. If you add food coloring, um, that was suggested in the comment. Can you add food coloring? Um, food coloring is water-based, so it's not going to mix with the oil, and it may not work. You may need to apply it uh, separately. Um, but at that rate, if you need to mark them by color, um, I would suggest just hit them with a can of spray paint. That would probably be the easiest thing to do. <clears throat> All right, so this is the last slide I've got. Um, we did a similar presentation for uh, Clinton County back in May or June, I think it was June. Uh, in that I go over the biology a little in a little bit more detail. And then we have one of our private land foresters who talks more about um, impacts to individual trees and um, what they did for treatment out in the Finger Lakes. <clears throat> and then also it has um, 
a gentleman from Vermont who is an aerial applicator, and he talks about the kinds of information he needs and how they go about doing aerial applications. Um, so if you want, I, I kind of made an assumption that most people participating today had a decent background on gypsy moth, so I skipped over some things. <coughs> but if you need more detailed information, I would suggest you go to, to the link here. They, that was also recorded and is available on YouTube. Um, and if you're considering, considering aerial spraying, uh, you're a large landowner and want to know what you have going on, again, I would send you to the DEC website. <coughs> Just Google NYS DEC Gypsy Moth. Scroll down to the bottom. You'll get the uh, egg mass survey protocols and you'll see a link there to the hour long training on how to do it. You, um, and then it, once you've gone through the egg mass survey and determined that you think you need aerial spraying, uh, you can go back to this video that's linked on your screen and at about the 45 minute mark or so is when the gentleman comes on and starts talking about um, the aerial application um, process. So I think that uh, covers everything I had planned. Yep. Um, so now I th think I, and I think I got through all the questions that were uh, turned in prior to today. So now we're open for any additional questions, I think. I'll I ask here first. Yes, please come on up to the podium. Hi, Erwin Nathanson, Diamond Point. Uh, my wife, Julie, and I are here. We got really hit very hard, especially the oak trees and the maple trees. And something we found very effective, and Julie found this on the internet, was to use a hand vacuum. Hmm. It's a rechargeable. It was amazing how it just sucks up the egg sacs. Every, the egg sacs and the coating is so light. It got, every thing got sucked up right away and very little, if anything, fell to the ground. Very effective. And I would do this every day for about 45 minutes. And this is as long as the battery lasted. And I got tired and got grossed out. So <laughs> it all happened at one time. But I would dump the uh, canister into a bucket of soapy water and vegetable oil. Mm -hmm. And this is something we found on a website up in Toronto, that the, the uh, soapy water doesn't necessarily kill them, but the vegetable oil will coat the eggs and suffocate them. So I'm hoping we'll see a, a good benefit next year. Uh, we're also going to try the burlap. And the uh, hand vacuum also worked great for getting the, uh, the caterpillars off the house. <laughs> They're very light. They got sucked up right away, too. And if we just dumped them in soapy water, that killed them. And then when they became moths, the vacuum cleaner also worked great to get the moths that were all around the house. So our strategy was get as many caterpillars as we could before they became moths get as many moths as we could before they laid eggs. And then the main focus was getting the egg sacs. So I hope we'll see a, a benefit, but we wanted to share that because the uh, hand vacuum worked amazing. It really sucks up those eggs in the sacs. So thank you. Thank you. Can I also say a dedicated hand vacuum? <laughs> <laughs> dedicated to them. All right, Julie went up, we bring it back in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, we won't be. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, the sticky wrap or the sticky tape, uh, then the burlap, and then I would say the, the hand vacuuming. So is that the right process then? First, it's the sticky tape, then you progress for the um, pupating stage to the burlap and then to the vacuuming for the, the eggs. Is that correct? Uh, <clears throat> yep, yeah, the sticky band, the, the burlap is really for the pupating stage. So anything before that, uh, yeah, use the sticky band. Yep, and then sucking up the eggs, that's perfect. I know it's a lot of work and I, you know, suggesting it kind of sounds like, well, I'm giving you a, a, a second job. And I know I've talked to a lot of people who put in a lot of time, but those folks who did, you know, what you're talking about doing, a, a, a lot of them felt they were making a big impact and 
you know, just by the numbers of, of caterpillars they were finding and killing. Uh, and some of them even said, hey, I put a sticky band and burlap on this one tree and that tree looks way better than the rest of my yard. So we do have some anecdotal evidence for sure that it, it, that it does work. So I keep it up as long as you can, yeah. Great, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, I would like to know if the spidery sacks that you see on cherry trees now have anything to do with the gypsy moth? Oh yeah, uh, so no, those aren't gypsy moth. Those are uh, another kind of caterpillar called fall webworm. And uh, yeah, they're really ugly looking and kind of nasty, you know, that that big web forms along the tree branches with all the leaves in it. And they, they hang out in there and, and they're eating in it. And then, so they poop in it. So yeah, it all looks very disgusting. Um, as far as their damage to the tree goes though, because those happen so much later in the season, you know, you don't usually see that starting until sometime middle of August. And now they're real ugly looking now. Um, the tree is, more or less done with the leaves at this point. So late season defoliation, uh, like you see with fall webworm, doesn't really impact the long-term health of the trees because they're just, they're, they're not using the leaves now. The, the bad defoliation is what occurs early in the season when the tree's really trying to grow, put out new roots, put out new leaves, that, which is what gypsy moth does. So that's really bad. But these later season ones like fall webworm are not, um, they're not a big concern to the health of your tree. Oh, thank you. I also have another question. Mm -hmm. Do the uh, uh, moths come in a cycle? Will it is be bad next year? Well, yeah, so uh, um, I, I, they're going to be out next year. It's really hard to predict. Um, that's why I was talking about doing that egg mass survey to see how many eggs were laid. And then one thing when you do that survey, as you measure some of the egg masses, because the size of the egg mass indicates the health of the gypsy moth and the health of the gypsy moth population. So um, yeah, usually it's uh, two to three years of defoliation before the population crashes. So, um, you know, this was the first really bad year, although there was some around last year. So I would expect um, to see defoliation again next year, it really just depends on um, how much the fungus and the virus really get to it uh, this fall. Thank you. <clears throat> yep, you're welcome. Any other questions here? Sure. <clears throat> uh, my name is Chuck. Um, I've got a, a few questions. First of all, um, in one of your uh, uh, graphics you put up there. Why was there such a large concentration around the lake? Is the lake drawing that? Um, I wouldn't say the lake is drawing it. There's, it it's, uh, it, there, I'm guessing uh, the forest composition there has most to do with it. Uh, you know, around the lake is, is where, uh, um, especially seeing like on the uh, west side there, there is a lot of oak and that being the primary host. Uh, my guess would be is that supported probably like last year's population since the preference is oak. Uh, and then they spilled over into a lot of other things uh, this year. But I don't, I, I think it's, yeah, it's condi site conditions there and, and the tree species on it. I, I wouldn't say it was directly related to the lake. If we decide to do individual spraying, do we need a permit? Um, well, you're going to hire, uh, you. If, if you choose any of the spraying methods, you'll be hiring a, a certified applicator who would have all the proper permits to do that kind of spraying. Um, this doesn't require, uh, as far as I know, any any special permits or anything because you're using it near water or anything like that. Like I said, impacts to water are super minimal. Impacts to human health don't exist. So, um, no, I think if, when you hire your certified applicator, they'll have all the permits that you need. Okay, so if we do aerial spraying, the the person who runs the program should be getting the permit. Correct. All right. What's the survival rate of the egg masses? Oh, 
that's a great question. I don't know the answer right off the top of my head. Um, you know, the, th the thing is, is, uh, you know, an, an egg mass, maybe it's got a hundred more eggs in it. And then you've got 40, 50 of these on a tree. And then you've got how many trees, um, you would need a huge amount of, um, mortality in the egg masses to make a big difference so i don't really know what it is i don't think it, it's not significant though so you wouldn't say it's like 50 percent make it and 50 percent don't probably no i would i would say more make it than that probably and that's uh you know that's where those the the um i showed that parasitoid the egg parasitoid there the wasp now in, in that location where i took that photo yeah, it, uh, uh, you know, the literature says up to 40% mortality in an egg mass can be caused by that parasitic wasp. So um, where you find that, yeah, you're going to see high numbers. I think, you know, the fungus and the virus reduce the caterpillar numbers and they go over, go after the actual caterpillar. So that's where you see a lot of your mortality and knockdown of the population for the next year. So could I buy the virus or the bacteria? Um... I, I'm not sure uh, if you could buy it or if you would need to be uh, an applicator to purchase it. But you do need to be a certified applicator to apply it. Okay. What happens if I've used bleach? What, what did you do with bleach? Well, for example, you showed a picture of it on uh, the house. Suppose I uh -huh. lightly sprayed the side of my house with bleach. They're not going to uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> well okay so uh <laughs> this is, i cannot recommend you use anything not labeled as a pesticide as a pesticide so um i'm gonna guess that the caterpillars don't like the bleach and the side of your house is going to be real clean um but uh i can't recommend that that's what you do same thing with a, with an egg mass if i sprayed an egg mass with a little bit of bleach or sprayed around the base of a tree, not necessarily the, the bark or the bark or the ground or a circle around it. Mm -hmm. Would that help? Uh, I don't know. If you want to spray something on the egg masses, really, uh, you know, the oil, something oily is the way to go. So those, you know, the neem oil or the horticultural oil that I mentioned earlier, what that does when you put it on the egg mass is, is smother it. It's, it suffocates it. So anything that you can put on there that's gonna that's gonna suffocate the eggs so something you know thick something viscous um you know if you want to put something on the egg masses i don't i don't know about bleach though because you saw the pictures of the eggs i mean they had there's a legit egg under that egg mass so i'm, I'm just not sure if it would eat through the egg mass the egg or whatever so all right now on your on your graphic that said gypsy moth 2021 map Mm -hmm. I've seen a map similar to that before. And what happens the next year after you see a map like that? Is it predictable? Uh, 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 again, that goes back to, um, it goes back to that egg mass survey. It really does. So this year's, the important thing for next year is how many eggs got, how many egg masses got laid and then what happens to them over the winter. So we, I showed you the egg mass that had the parasitoids um, but, uh, yeah, I kind of lost track of where I was going with that. So what you're saying from looking at that map with, with it was, um, a lot of the leaves were off all those trees in that map. You really can't, you're just showing us an area that was just wiped out versus you're saying, um, you need to actually look at the trees and see how the egg masses are. Right. So like in those pictures, um, that could have been like the apex year of defoliation. And you could look at that and go, well, shoot, it got just defoliated this year. Same thing's going to happen next year. But you could walk into that stand and realize and, and go through and do an egg mass survey. And maybe the egg mass numbers are really low because they could do all that defoliation uh, but then they start getting hit by the virus or they start getting hit by the fungus and they never make it to the egg laying stage uh, or or they move, you know, some, you know, 
in areas that got defoliated last year does not necessarily mean they get defoliated this year. And if they got defoliated this year, doesn't necessarily mean they'll get defoliated next year. I mean, there is some unknowns about how gypsy moth are moving around or, or why they're moving around, you know? So, um, you know, like that ballooning in is a big thing. You know, you could have a large population in one spot this year, they hatch out next year and balloon, you know, three doors down to your neighbor's property and they've left your property. You know, uh, that part is really hard to predict. So you could see from the 2020 to 2021, it was a huge explosion. And we surveyed around a lot of those areas. We, you know, did the aerial survey and, uh, you know, how it goes from one to the other, that's, you know, there's a lot of research that goes into that and nobody really knows. All right, with regards to the wet weather, um, mm -hmm. are you saying we lucked out with the wet weather because that might increase the fungus? Yes, yeah. So I, I think the wet July increased the fungus and the bacteria. I also think um, that it was a bonus for the tree health also. After getting defoliated, they needed as much water as they could get uh, to grow on those new leaves. So I think, you know, the wet July kind of stunk for hanging out outside, but it was, it was good for the trees. All right, is there a tipping point where the state will step in and, and uh, remediate? Or is it just, this is not a top high priority? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't see a scenario where we would step in. Um, you know, like in your area now, uh, we're going all out for Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. That's our big, our big scary thing going on in Lake George right now. And so, um, yeah, you know, we got a divide and conquer kind of, and Gypsy Moth is one that that doesn't doesn't really make the list. All right, now they all they eat leaves. Did did you say they eat our lawn too? <laughs> yeah, uh, in, in really high populations, I did have people reporting to me. I've never, I've never uh, seen this directly, um, but this year getting calls over the summer, I had people reporting they were on all of their landscaping plants, they were eating the grass, you know, and, and, and you know, when I look it up in the literature, you know, they will feed on that stuff, but they've never been known to be like a threat to your, you know, to turf, per se. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. See? I think we have one more question here, and then uh, I don't know, Don, if we have any. Uh, okay. <clears throat> First of all, uh, thank you for the presentation today. And I just have a couple of just quick questions so I can understand this better. You know, I'm fully cognizant of the HWA problem up here and work with the Land Conservancy and the other groups around to correct that. But when you said that this uh, gypsy moth is not high on state problems or priority, uh, what does it take to get it up there? I, I know the uh, HWA program, we work with Cornell on that, Mark Whitmore and stuff like that. But I would think this is the same thing because it's, it, it's impacted the town of Hague quite extensively, just as we know where the HWA is around the lake. So if that's the case and you're helping them, why wouldn't this become a priority and the state take maybe some RCA money or something like that and loosen it up and help uh, communities and uh, associations to help offset spraying costs to try and correct and control this? Uh, yeah, so um, one of the differences being uh, when those hemlocks get HWA, uh, the HWA is here to stay and it's eventually going to kill those trees. Um, with gypsy moth, it has the capacity to kill trees and it does kill trees. Um, but if, it's no consolation to the homeowner who has a few nice oaks in their yard. They may die. Um, but on, on the New York landscape level, um, we don't see a significant amount of oak mortality or other tree species mortality caused by gypsy moth, nor are we concerned that we are going to lose all of the oak to gypsy moth. So that's kind of the difference between it and hemlock woolly adelgid. 
Um, the HWA is going to kill all the hemlock uh, if something can't be done. So there's there's a lot of people working on that. Uh, whereas with gypsy moth, you give it a couple of years and it goes away and you may not see it again for 15, 20 years uh, and it'll come back and kill a couple trees and then it'll be gone again. So um, that's why we have difficulty prioritizing it is because it is something that, uh, you know, as a whole does take care of itself eventually. Okay, so what I'm, the question I would have then is you mentioned how it affects hemlocks, uh, and it also affects uh, white pines. You know, a 150-foot white pine tree that gets sick uh, with uh, from gypsy moss and uh, falls is going to make a real mess on some houses. And I've seen it somewhere there's been some water uh, issues where they've come and they've squashed houses. And again, you know, and you did mention that it does affect the uh, white pines and now, up in our area in Hague, there's a lot of white pines, as, as Jim knows. And, uh, you know, if those things die and they start dropping down on people's houses, you know, that's going to be a, a terrible expense and it's going to be a potential loss of life. You know, so, I, and again, I had quotes from some real good tree people, you know, to take a 150 foot tree down, it's $2,600. Uh, in lieu of that, you, but people say, well, then you have insurance, but if insurance falls on your house and it kills you know, your kids, that's not a good thing. So. Is there any reason that the state might, or is there any reason why the state would not be able to put funding available to homeowner associations, towns, uh, to help offset the cost of aerial spraying? Um, the best avenue to make that happen would be uh, talking to your uh, elected officials and representatives. So, uh, you know, DEC gets a budget, but our budget does come from the legislature. Um, you know, we don't, uh, so, so we have no money uh, laid out for this ahead of time. Uh, so if we wanted to get involved with, with putting money out, like you said, to either homeowners or, you know, uh, you know lake associations or whatever, um, we would need the money to do that first. And that would have to come from our elected officials. Uh, and then this, the, the second thing, which is, you know, it's a, it's, you know, we have trouble getting out of our own way, but I, I think I mentioned it, we don't really have a mechanism to do that. So uh, if, if I had money, I would have to contract with all the individual landowners. Uh, and so that would be, you know, a, a 12 month process. That's how long it takes us to write a contract in the state. Uh, and by then the gypsy moth problem, it would be too late. So, um, yeah, it's it's unfortunate. It's it's very difficult, and it, without more uh, political influence, uh, it's unlikely to happen. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> oh, no, I lied. We have a few more questions here. Thank you again for having for having this. Could you just elaborate just briefly on the horticultural oils? <clears throat> and uh, as I understand it, if you have, like I have literally hundreds of egg masses, uh, most of them are low down below the, the sticky bone, the sticky uh, barriers that, that I had. Um, but to scrape them off, I mean, and, and do it neatly and not have the eggs spill out and, and, and maybe do damage to the bark and all that. What, what I'm hearing is, is the horticultural oil or dormant, whatever it's called, if you can get that on, it will saturate those egg masses just as well as it would, you know, if you try to scrape them off and put them in water. Can, can that be like sprayed on with a, I mean, like a close up, like with a Windex bottle, you know, and, and just just spray them, zap them, and, and do it repeatedly. And yep. then, but basically leave them on there. I mean, maybe you could try to scrape them off, but. Uh, yeah, but with, the oil, with the oil, there's no need to scrape them off. Um, and yeah, you can spray it, in a spray it in a bottle. I'm not sure, uh, I haven't looked recently how, like what size container you buy it in or whatever, but um, yeah, you can apply that yourself. And you would just spray it on there, make sure the egg mass was soaked and covered. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, it suffocates them in there, uh, just smothers them, and uh, they won't survive. So if you spray them, you don't have to scrape. 
right. spray. Now, and and this is avail. Is this the stuff that's available, like like Bonide or All Season? I guess it's available in Walmart. Some of this stuff. Um. Yeah, you should be able to find dormant oils in, in any sort of garden center or anything. I don't know. Um, like brand names. I can okay. give you brand names, but um, but yeah. it's available and it's not you know as long as it's labeled for the for the gypsy moth and you can use it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, you mentioned something that that's very expensive that maybe is is a kind of oil that you said maybe. Oh everybody... yeah, well that was um, that was one of the questions that I uh, had received. I, it had just said um, the oil recommended for this purpose is very expensive. Would it be possible to bulk purchase it to bring the cost down? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the exact cost. I was just reading that from one of the questions. Um, and so then I just suggested, well, if you want to bulk purchase it, go in, you know, talk to your neighbors, see if they need any, and maybe you can buy it more than just buying it in, you know, the one gallon jug or whatever at Walmart. Um, but I don't know the exact price. Okay. Did, did you mention the specific name and that I heard some neem oil or something? Or uh, yeah. So, um, horticulture oil, dormant oil, neem oil, they're neem. all very similar. Um, in fact, people use those names interchangeably, although I'm not 100% sure that's accurate. Um, but yeah, any, any three of those, anything you find dormant, oil, neem oil. Okay. Yep. And then kill them. I mean, that'll, that'll saturate them and they're, they're done. Yep. I mean, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thanks. I know you've been doing this a long time, so. <laughs> um, but I have a couple of quick questions. We um, have a campground up on Trout Lake on Diamond Point, and yes, we got decimated. Um, couple quick questions, though. Females don't fly, correct? Correct. How many eggs are in uh, an egg sack, approximately? I, I think it's around 100. OK. Um, so we had our campers out. Um, I put a wanted poster out on the entire life cycle this summer at camp and we all went around and we're scraping the trees and, and killing all the females that we could find. Um, does, you know, can they lay multiple egg sacs or do they just, uh, I think it's just the one, although I'm not hundred percent sure. Sorry about that. Okay, that's all good. Um, now, just one other quick question about this spraying. And I know you say it's completely fine. And with all due respect, we've heard that about a lot of things. So mm -hmm. I just a couple of clarifications. Um, so this virus, um, I do some work with monarch caterpillars and I have seen that same thing happen with them. Sometimes it's fungus that happens, humidity, blah, blah, blah. This virus that's being sprayed, can that not affect um, the moths and the butterflies that overwinter in their pupil stage? Because do you do the spraying in the fall, correct? No, the spraying is the spraying is the spring in the okay. spring just after they hatch. So your spraying will probably probably take place in May, sometime in May. So yeah, and like I said, any there are some other caterpillars uh, that have overlapping life cycles and could be out at the same time as your treatment. So that would be the risk. Um, I'm not sure about monarchs though, being uh, overlapping at that time. So I think you would be okay. Yeah, they, they're in Mexico at that point. So it's all yeah. good. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's coming back, but there are others that overwinter mm -hmm. um, yeah. in leaf piles and underground. and. So if you're spraying this, is that, not, is that going to affect them as well? Yeah, so when you're spraying either the, the BT or the MPV, um, that's droplets that hit the leaves and it comes down through the trees and coat should, you know, in theory is coating the crowns of the trees. And then the caterpillars have to ingest it. So I think anything that was overwintering on the ground, uh, if, if, it's, if it eats it, yes, it could be impacted, but... Um, you know, if it's in a in an egg life stage or something like that, then I don't think it would be impacted. Okay, thanks. And how long have these springs been used? 
How many years have, have we been using oh, um MPV, I think, was developed in the 90s, and BT goes back quite a bit further than that. Yeah, okay. they've been around for quite a while. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. And one thing I'd just like to point out on the, uh, even with the sticky tape, you know, because I put on our Facebook, you know, hey, you can do it. You can do your own. I tried it. I figure if I'm going to recommend something, I better do it myself. So I tried it with uh, inverted duct tape just for a couple of evenings to try it. And uh, I didn't like the bycatch, as they would say, you know, I got some bees, I got beneficial insects. So I stopped it. So whatever we're going to do, there's potential for a negative impact. That's where I think it's a, basically a cost benefit analysis of, you know, what we're going to affect, how badly will affect it. And that could be a physical barrier or it could be uh, uh, some type of insecticide. So yeah, there's a lot of decisions that have to go into this. So Don. Hi, uh, Rob. Thank you very much for doing this. We have a lot of people watching on YouTube, which has worked out very well. Uh, we have some questions there as well as uh, some late emails. Uh, a couple people asked about spring BT near uh, water bodies, particularly Lake George. Is there a, is that something where you'd need a, um, like a professional to do that, uh, obviously, or would you? Um, well, yeah, with the BT, uh, I'm almost positive in New York, you're going to have to be a certified applicator. So um, you're probably not doing that yourself. Certainly, if you're doing any large scale spraying by air, you're going to have a certified applicator. Um, I'm not aware of any other special permits or anything you would need for working your water bodies. However, uh, whoever your applicator is, they should know that stuff. And if by chance you can do any of these applications on your own, then you would have to go uh, online to determine that yourself based on your um, specific circumstance. But again, these are, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to say no impact to water, uh, but that's kind of what the literature says. So, you know, with a grain of salt, obviously, but this BT is, uh, is considered very, very safe. Thank you. Uh, another person asked about the use of soybean oil to kill eggs, a soybean oil water mixture. Is that something can, that can be used? Um, possibly again, you know, uh, with the oils, it's for smothering egg masses. So I haven't gone out and tested all sorts of different oils. Uh, and, and, and that's, I, I haven't seen anything like that in the literature. Um, so you could try it again. Um, I can't, I can't say use something that's not labeled as a pesticide. I can't say use it as a pesticide. So. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. A uh, few people asked, and I, I know you talked about this a little bit earlier on, but hemlocks, spruce, and white pines are refoliating. They generally do not refoliate. Is that correct? Yeah, that's generally what we've seen from the literature is um, they do not refoliate very well. It's just not a mechanism that they have built in uh, like the deciduous trees. So if people are seeing that, that's great. I just, it's not the norm. Uh, Others asked then if that does occur, does that mean those trees are dead and should be cut down at this point or? Uh, yeah, if you experienced over, you know, if your tree still has needles on it, I would say, let it go. I mean, I'm, I'm not one to rush out and cut trees down though. So, um, but yeah, if you've got green needles, I think, you know, on these individual cases, uh, about, you know, a tree in your yard and its survivability, you know, you're really going to need to call a, a tree care company so that they can come out and evaluate the site and the exact amount of defoliation and kind of help you go from there. Uh, it is hard just to kind of guess and make a generalized statement on that. Uh, another question was about the purchasing of neem oil in these oils. Those are often at garden centers and, and mm -hmm. Walmart's, uh, Lowe's, that sort of thing. Yep. Um, another person asked about disposing of cut down trees with egg masses. Should anything be done particularly with those or, uh, uh, yeah. And actually I think we did, I ha did miss a question here. Somebody did ask about chipping. So if you have a tree removed and it's got egg masses on it, um, those egg masses, if left undisturbed, will, 
will hatch out gypsy moths in the spring. Um, somebody asked about, they were having a couple dead trees removed and they had egg masses on them. Uh, was chipping going to kill the egg masses or would it move it around? Um, chipping probably will kill the egg masses. Uh, although I'm not sure if there's any literature on this, but we've looked at this with emerald ash borer. And basically when you feed a log into a chipper and then it instantly accelerates to, you know, eight or 900 RPMs, that pretty much kills it right then if it doesn't happen to get hit by the chipper blade itself. Um, so chipping certainly would be great. Um, but like I said, I mean, a dead, you know, a tree, a dead tree moving along the road is no different than the egg mass being on the side of your house. I mean, the egg mass isn't getting anything from the tree. It's just a surface to lay it on. So it certainly would survive. Um, again, though, think about, you know, the large area covered by gypsy moth, unless you have a tree taken down and they're going to drive it, you know, down to Kingston or someplace, um, they're probably going to dispose of that tree somewhere where there's already gypsy moth. So I wouldn't say that was a huge concern. Thank you. Uh, another question, what kind of fertilizer can we use to help damage trees? Um, you know, I don't have any specific recommendations for fertilizer. Um, I would stay away from any fertilizer that is going to promote uh, growth. Um, and that being because, uh, you know, like this year, uh, trees, they used a ton of energy to put their leaves out and then they got defoliated. So then they used another ton of energy to get the leaves out. So um, we don't want to be pushing them real hard to you know like grow next year they they really need to work on the reserves so um, my big thing like i talked about earlier for defoliate defoliated trees is just making sure they're they're watered um fertilizer you know yeah i don't have any specific recommendations i'm not sure fertilizing would necessarily be the best idea in most cases uh, and this is pretty much the last question. Someone asked about the use of heat, particularly blowtorch, to kill egg masses. Obviously, oh, careful. Yeah, I saw that in a couple of the questions, uh, and I didn't bring that up. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's always those stories out there of the person who lit their tree on fire or burnt something down that they didn't intend to burn down because they were out with a blowtorch you know, going after egg masses, or, you know, we talked about the fall webworm going after those tents. I mean, yes, a blowtorch is going to kill them. Um, but you would need to be careful, just like your pressure washer could strip the bark off. You know, if you hold your blowtorch there too long, you are going to do some localized damage. And if you were to do that 40 times around the base of the tree or something, that, that, that may not be great. But I would say there, the biggest thing is your safety and not burning stuff down. Actually, there was one more quick one here uh, asking if you could address the safety of the product seven, S-E-V-I-N, obviously. Uh, I, I know that people were using it uh, for Gypsy Moth, uh, but I, you know, again, when it comes to pesticides and safety information, your best and the only uh, legal source of safety information for a pesticide is on its label. So I would refer anyone who has questions about its safety to read the label. Great, thank you very much. And, and anyone who's watching on YouTube now, this video will be archived on there. There's a good discussion there with people with different suggestions. Uh, so feel free to jump on and, and uh, watch again. Anyone who's here, if you missed something or wanted to catch back up on it, it'll be right there on the Warren County YouTube page. Okay. And uh, thank you, uh, Rob. We really appreciate that. Really, you know, I think it was uh, very informative and uh, um, it's important for people to hear the information, whether they like it or not. At least there's some, you know, uh, continuous uh, data that you're able to provide. So um, I think it's very important for folks to understand a couple other things. One is, uh, there's a lot of tree diseases out there, a lot of pests, a lot uh, that kill our trees, that go after our trees. 
Um, at th this point, I was thinking we even have a invasive species that's going after an invasive species, uh, the spotted lanternfly on the Atlantis. You know, it's we're going to be seeing all this. So, um, you know, if you see a tree dying, don't just automatically assume it's necessarily from gypsy moth. There's a lot of other things that are out there to eat them. Um, but it's a very important, uh, especially in our county, we are the third most forested county in New York State. So at about 80 percent, only Hamilton and Essex County are greater. Uh, so uh, forest health is exceptionally important for um, our recreational pursuits, uh, for our industries, for our general overall um, uh, living here. So, um, you know, if you would like more, please visit the DEC's website. Um, come talk to talk to us at Soil and Water. We don't know everything, uh, but that's why I think that we're generally successful because we know people <laughs> and we can send them your send them your way. So, if you do have any questions, please feel free. And um, as I said, if you have other questions. Uh, Don will keep an eye out for on the Warren County Strong uh, email, and uh, you can email me or go to our Facebook page. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody who participated, and um, hopefully we do not have to do this next year. So but we'll see. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. That was great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>